Star Wars Squadrons Podcast, Episode 8. It's February 5th. I'm your host, Time Palm, the other host with us every week, Green Fox Leader. How you doing, buddy? Hey, what's going on, man? Another week, uh, another week in 2021, pushing things along the pipe. Got a brand new uh, brand new season coming up for Squadrons here. It's pretty exciting. So looking forward to talking to people about that. That's right. New operation is hit. Game is sort of reset, and we're going to get into that. Uh, maybe possible balance changes, and everything having to do with being a Slayer. On this episode, we have one of the best Slayers in the game. He's got one of the highest kill ratios in the SEL. Played for Skull Squadron, and a little bit for Orange, too. Please give a warm, warm welcome. Gio, thank you for being on the podcast, buddy. Hey, guys. Glad to talk to you. Hey, Gio. Yeah, man. I was, I was so hyped the other day when you kind of let us know how well you were doing in SEL, man. Like, I was on it. So just, like, seeing, you know, people that I play with regularly having that success on, like, the highest level is so awesome. Congrats, man. So I just yeah, got to give a disclaimer right away. Uh-huh. Um, I'm, I'm really happy that the stats make me look good. But, um, <laughs> the, uh, the, best, the best player on our team is uh, Polytonic. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And so he's Interceptor player. He's not just Slayer. He really focuses on getting cap ship damage in as well. And basically what happened the other week was... In the first match, uh, it was Empire, and I wasn't one of the ones flying. And he pissed the enemy team off so bad by killing them and by doing cap ship damage and just, like, shutting them down that they, uh, in the second match, just focused him and would not let up. So I had no one on me the entire game. I could get some, a whole bunch of kills without anyone touching me. And uh, that was obviously not very balanced for the stats. So I yeah. floated up probably a few ranks higher than I belong. Um, <laughs> but uh, definitely pilot error, uh, Polytonic deserves all the credit there. Yeah, Polly's, wow. Polly's an amazing. Actually, you know, a little background in my squadron. Polytonic, one of the first people that I actually approached in Star Wars Squadrons to be like, hey man, you want to play more? You're really good at the game. Let's play. So it's funny that like, I, I lo- it's funny that all these people that I've met early on in the game were are just like, some of the top players in the game now. It's just so funny the way that that's kind of like worked around. He's Paulie's a great player. Um, I was gonna ask Gio, you kind of came to the game a little bit later though, too, right? Was it closer to season two when you really started playing more? Because I remember that's when I met you. How did you get into the game? Um, I played for like uh, a week or two around release, um, but I didn't get too competitive because um, uh, the friend that I started playing with, he. Um, he had some technical issues, and I was only really playing with him. Um, I wasn't solo queuing. And then, uh, I don't know, I started missing the game after a week or two away. So around the end of October, beginning of November, I started up again. Um, and I uh, I was solo queuing, and it's, let's say, a tough life because, you know, you, you <laughs> yeah. can go, you can go uh, especially as an interceptor pilot, you, you can do a lot of killing, but if your team doesn't know how to get past the shields of the enemy flagship because you're in, you know, uh, well, at the time it was Maverick, but let's say uh, a high hot shot, um, then uh, you're, you're still not going to win the match. So I've got, I've got scoreboards where I go like 34 and 4 <laughs> with 20k cap ship damage, and our team lost. And it's like, you can't do anything. Um, mm-hmm. So I ran into a uh, streamer there, actually, uh, Poi Boy TV. Um, and we started duo queuing, and he knew about stuff like SWS Five Mans and competitive scene and shit that i never heard of and i was like oh all right yeah no that sounds cool and i was nice you know i'm not a competitive gamer so i was very reluctant to get into all of this but everyone's really nice and it was uh mm-hmm. it was a great transition it's i think a game that is much more engaging and fun to play as you get to the more competitive levels because there's a whole bunch of depth that you can't really access until you have the full five stack of people who know how to play their roles and can work together yeah 100 percent. it's a completely <laughs> different game with competent five man five mans than it is with you know random solos like it just yeah the game's just not really meant to be played that way in the same it, it doesn't hit the depth like you're saying that's such a such a good point i was gonna ask what is your setup are you using like a hotas what how do you play 
Um, I play with joystick and keyboard. I've got the uh, $40 Logitech joystick. Uh, it's the Extreme 3D Pro, which just sounds like someone tried way too hard naming it. Um, <laughs> and then I've got the keyboard, which handles uh, this. This stick's got a throttle on it, but I'm not crazy about it. Um, yeah. So I use uh, two keys for throttle, and then I've got you know max shields in either direction. And then for power management, I've just got max each of them. So I use advanced power management. And I just have max buttons, so I tap, you know, like max lasers, max shields. That will give me half lasers, full shields. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I find that that's really all I'm using. I think if they rejiggered the power management just a little bit, so that having six pips in a power system instead of the full eight would, instead of continuing to overcharge it, just sustain the full charge. Um, you might get some more depth in the way people use power. Um, but as is, just going you know, zero four eight or yeah. even across the board seems to be the best way to go. Um, so I'm happy with that. And then a, uh, a big thing that I think a lot of people who start out might miss is you want a separate, if you're on PC, you want a separate button for boost and drift. Yeah. Um, so you can transition between those really quickly instead of having to fight the controls a little. Yeah, even on controller, I do have a second boost and drift button that I've, it's just hard to work in on controller. It's a little bit different. But I think about that because there's that little bit of time sure. where you're holding the button in and you would have to release and then press it again that you could make up by switching to another button. I've thought about that. That's a good idea. Uh, that's really cool, too, that you use, like, such... Because a lot of people are using, you know, $200 flight sticks, $400 sticks, and you're here's Geo. You're like, yeah, no, I just use this $40 stick. That's pretty cool. It's, I would love to try one of those sticks. I'm just... I'm really scared to, like, spend $200 on a flight stick and then be like... Yeah. You know, this doesn't feel great. I don't like it. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. You know. yeah. So yeah, some of the best players in the game use uh, Hosack, you know, uh, hands-on stick and keyboard. So stick and keyboard is an old-school X-Wing versus TIE Fighter uh, yeah. setup that people have used using, for years and years. I'm actually using yeah. almost my exact control scheme from X-Wing versus TIE Fighter. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so some of that muscle memory, you know, hopefully it would kick in a little bit so you could skip a little bit of that learning curve just by – having that feel down uh, with the exact buttons on your left hand and then the analog movement on your right hand for aiming. Exactly. And we have, I just had to give a shout out, one uh, psychopath on our competitive team on Skull. Mm -hmm. um, again, pilot error, polytonic, who plays with one hand on the numpad and one hand on the WASD keys. Man. He's a keyboard and keyboard player. He's a complete psychopath, but like I said, he mm. is the best interceptor on our team. So, do not blame your control. <laughs> I Whoever was, you are, you can you can do this game with just a keyboard. All you need are buttons. No complaining. I was literally yeah. just about to ask that about pilot about, about pilot error because I saw his stream the other day when he was he was showing his keyboard on keyboard. That is that was so wild to me. And exactly mm -hmm. like you're saying, like what? How can someone make an excuse about their controller when or anything when he's using a keyboard? Yeah, if people keep asking like, oh, what kind of. Uh controls you guys um putting restrictions on for the car racing cup and since the very beginning it was always the thought of uh similar to um ready player one where the corporations got millions of dollars and the best haptic feedback suits and the, all the stuff and the fanciest gizmos and then you got some scrappy kids in a, a trailer park stacked on top of one another with just a little tiny box and one set of gloves and that's all you got so like everyone's you know um <laughs> talk about different inputs they're just they're fancy ways of getting from point a to point b but you still have to use teamwork you still have to do coordinated strikes on objectives quicker faster more efficiently than the other team whether you have fancy equipment or not and i think like an input is an input a button press is a button press whether it's on a joystick a keyboard a controller in your hands small big fat wide you know it could be a, a full-on x-wing uh sim pit right that you have all buttons all over the place uh, and it, it takes a long time to get to them. But if that's, you know, if you end up getting more comfortable with it and getting more wins with it, then that is what it is. And that's kind of what the, po the point of this big competition is, is to see what the best pilots in the game are using to get the most efficient use of energy management, power management, flight movement, you know, aiming, all that stuff. It's interesting here, keyboard on keyboard, you know, some of the top pilots are using that. I think a lot of the equity in control schemes comes from very good game design. Um, it's subtle, so it's easy to miss if you're not looking for it. But there's just 
uh, very, very smart features. It's, it's well laid out. So it's things like putting lots of combo buttons so that people on controllers can do complicated sequences without mm -hmm. having to kill themselves. I think there was a minor oversight there where uh, they didn't give people with controllers yeah. quick, quick tap bindings for maxing power systems, but that's something they can yeah. it's, easily. It's, I've talked to with, it. I've uh, actually been in on that issue too a little bit because it affects me so much. And it is a limitation of the both the controller, like how many buttons it has, and as well the fact that the advanced power it uses like a, a tap to to add the pip. So you can't add in you can't add in double tap features like you need because it has like a tap feature to pip them up kind of a thing. So yeah, right. yeah, but you yeah. could unbind the regular. That would be um, nice. Yeah. yeah. On the power management. And that would be put nice. It only into. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So that, mm -hmm. that would be my suggestion yeah, because that's yeah. what I did with my keyboard is I, I removed, I have no bindings to increase the power in a system only to maximize it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. And I think having that option would be smart. Though I, 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 I understand that the uh, developers may not have anticipated that people they would did. only ever need mm -hmm. to maximize this. So um, the that's um, just stuff that comes out when you play it. And with, I can articulate um, the issue there too, is because their only option is to have maximized power as <laughs> hold input, and you can't. You need to be able to switch right. the hold to something else. That's basically the problem. Yes. Right. So that's that's yeah. the only I think real oversight in the mm -hmm. control scheme. The rest of it I think was very very smart. Mm -hmm. um, you have you have just subtle touches like uh, when you hit half power the or half engines the sweet spot on your throttle, um, you get a quiet little beep to mm -hmm. indicate that you went there. And I think for most players, you stop hearing that after a while. But certainly, if someone uses the keyboard for a throttle, that's a very, very important in, uh, bit of feedback for me from audio. Mm -hmm. um, it, it tells me that I'm where I need to be, even though I don't have a physical throttle or a stick that I can push forward and backward mm -hmm. where I feel the position. Yeah, there's audio cues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's awesome. Yeah. And I still do use them too, but it's more like uh, the feel. Like you're just kind of like, I don't know, you're just, you're so used to doing it. I feel like that's kind of like I'm. Uh, I'm not really surprised where my throttle position is, but when I look at it, I kind of know. I find if I experiment with a new engine or something, I still have trouble. Uh, so, like, I um, I was a big fan of the propulsion engine for a long time, mm -hmm. um, and I've started branching out a little bit more. And you on the jet the jet engine craze? That no, seems to be talking I'm about. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not about that. I I, uh, I pretty much just fly Interceptor and Tie Defender, so mm -hmm. I don't really have a jet engine available to me. Mm -hmm. um, True. And if we did, I imagine uh, just extrapolating, right? So the jet engine, um, it's uh, your boost recharges twice as fast, um, but on bombers it gets used twice as fast, and on uh, starfighters like the X-wing and the Tie fighter, it gets used two and a half times fast as fast. All right, so it's plus mm -hmm. 150 percent. So just extrapolating, if you brought that to an A-wing or you know a, a Tie interceptor, it would get used uh, probably three times as fast or something like that, and that's starting to be a big sacrifice especially when you are a flimsy little ship that needs to run the hell away a lot um, yeah that's true and the uh the strategy that seems to do it best for ships that size is that you know your speed is good enough and your boost is uh with the exception of the tie interceptor which i actually have some trouble with this um is uh boost gasping so you boost um immediately once you reach the top speed of your boost you put all the power out of the engines to minimize your deceleration rate oh um, okay and then and then you with power in you know lasers or lasers and shields if you have both of those systems you uh you begin a drift and then as soon as the drift begins you put the power back in engines mm -hmm. putting the power back in engines means that you're going to be regaining boost energy while you're drifting mm -hmm. and drifting doesn't stop until you reach your regular top speed so for this whole process you're above top speed right you're mm -hmm. starting off the boost so you jerk away from your current position you go shooting off in whatever direction you're pointing when that happened you start drifting at which point you can be facing any direction you want um and then when the drift ends you immediately begin another boost because you've recouped the energy that you needed for that and you can chain this indefinitely on i think everything i don't fly a bomber much but i can mm -hmm. tell you at least everything else can do this um and they put in a minor tweak to uh slightly decrease the effectiveness of it but it's hmm. not it's not much they uh they put something so like uh just the second you begin boosting you can't or drifting or something you can't regain power for a quick second but all that means is that you uh you leave the power in the other systems and you regain you know a little bit of laser charge a little bit of shields um and so when you when you do this what it's going to look like is your ship is going to go shoot off in a direction uh you know spin 
as it goes flying in that new direction. So you can look how whatever direction you want, track targets or plan a new direction. And then as soon as you boost again, you'll go shooting off in that direction. And you'll start curving out of this trajectory towards the end of it. But for the most part, you are just zipping around in a little, like uh, if you picture a ninja jumping <laughs> back and forth across like a wall or something. Yeah. Wow. And it's it's most mm -hmm. it's most powerful with the tie defender mm -hmm. because the tie defender has really fast power regeneration in every yeah. single system. So the lasers, the shields, the engines, these all recharge very very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and due to its bad acceleration in the first place, the drift can last a long time. Now there used to be a bug uh, in the aim bug. I don't want to really talk about much. That would mean that acceleration made you hard to hit because it messed up the aim assist. Mm -hmm. um, and you would want better acceleration for that. So even on the TIE Defender, you'd take the propulsion engine simply to exploit the bug harder, which uh, thankfully has been fixed and <laughs> isn't an issue anymore. Um, but now that it's gone, you uh, you really want to minimize the acceleration uh, if you're doing this sort of thing, because it will allow you to prolong that drift and spend more time above top speed without spending extra boost. Um, and this is definitely the meta for support and for interceptors i think for bombers and strike fighters it's a little different mm -hmm. um but certainly uh using this to corkscrew home or mm -hmm. dart you know zigzag uh and just keep jinking out of your enemy's guns is a very powerful strategy and mm -hmm. with interceptors you know if you're trying to tail someone you can exploit this as unlimited maneuverability on any ship basically because yeah. you perform this maneuver twice and you can be right behind whoever was chasing you huh. mm. is this similar to boost skipping what you're describing it's similar to boost skipping but with an extra step that when you're in the drift phase you're putting the power right back into mm -hmm, engines mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but you're just using that delay kind of the same way from what exactly I'm gotcha okay so during the drift you're just going to recoup all the energy you lost um it's a very powerful technique and it's certainly the a, a large part of the meta at high play high level play mm -hmm. and I, mm -hmm. I it's uh it's a very i don't know we we call it a high skill thing but i don't think it is it's really just muscle memory at some point it's yeah a barrier it's a barrier to entry for high levels because it means that players have to be aware of this technique and have to you know uh be talking to the community because you're mm -hmm. not going to invent this on your own unless you're you know, crazy smart. Like uh, I think this Tracer is the one who discovered this. Um, but uh, you know, once once someone teaches you, you can practice it, and then eventually be able to perform it in combat very uh, um, consistently, and you'll be effective with it. But it's not it's not like you're playing smarter. It's not like you have some more advanced strategy. It's really just a muscle memory thing, and I think it doesn't add a lot of depth to the gameplay. It's I think I think we would have a much deeper gameplay if they made it so that you can't recharge the boost while you're drifting so you have to be at your ship's regular top speed or below to recharge boost then the boost would become a strategic resource because you have to spend time essentially vulnerable flying as a regular ship before yeah. you can get more of this um which means if you're in a dogfight or something you could do you know spend a whole lot of boost doing some quick maneuvers but then you might not have enough to protect yourself at the end or to get out if you start getting into trouble and i, and I think that would bring some interesting changes i do think <laughs> that was i mean i don't know I, I i tend to think i guess here that that was probably closer to the intention of the design of the game that Absolutely. you have boost but it's a limited resource so you have to manage it and just the power management uh, skills have just gotten so far i think and people are finding little ways like this to just really uh maximize the power at all times to have boost as much as possible yeah it's a it's a great yeah, point. So I have not had the privilege of speaking with the development team mm -hmm. about game or anything. Um, I think they uh, can't spend too much time talking to us because you know they, you're going to get a lot of strong opinions. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I think I, it's word of mouth is telling me that they were not aware um, that dead drifting uh, was possible, which is uh, before drifting, removing mm -hmm. all power from engines to lower your acceleration so that it will take you longer to slow down back to your regular speed. Um, they uh, they were not aware that this was a thing, that this uh, they never thought of anyone removing power from engines until the drift was complete or, you know, certainly mm -hmm. not while boosting. 
um, because you know that's sort of the core of this is while you're boosting you're not regaining boost energy so for boost skipping and for this infinite dead drift chaining which uh, people call boost gasping um, okay. you uh, with, with these two techniques the, the core of it is that you're recharging lasers and or shields in the boost phase and then in the drift phase you're recharging engines and I don't think they anticipated either of those being possible so I certainly removing the increase in boost would bring it back closer to the original vision i think the being able to regenerate lasers and shields while you're doing this is still giving players a bonus for being very fast on the power management mm -hmm. and having some you know some real technical skills there but it brings back that uh strategic resource in combat and i think that's important i agree it is interesting too the point you made it's like muscle memory because like once you're doing like i know when i learned to dead drift and all this it's literally just more like it's not it's not thinking but just more having that at my uh at my disposal just quickly do it like just getting used to being able to do it so you don't so you don't have to think about it like that's that's when you're just yeah. doing these things to keep your power up i think that's when you become uh when these these skills really become dangerous in the competitive play mm. now when you're playing so usually, I think from what I've seen, when you're on Empire, you're usually in the A wing. But on the the sorry, on the Republic side, you're usually in the A wing. But on the Empire side, how does it? How are you determining if you're in a defender or an interceptor? Team needs, or what would it be for you? Um, so on the on the Republic, you know, obviously A wing is more or less the only choice for dogfighting. You can use an X wing, but it's I would say far less effective. Um, the A wing is my absolute favorite ship in this game it's a joy to fly i love the way it handles i love the balance between you know its offense its defense mm -hmm. the uh, the movement feels very natural and the um infinite boost drift chain is uh, it's really easy to pull off in the a-wing it feels great with the empire i have harder time pulling that off in the thai interceptor and i have a little bit of difficulty um because i like to waste tons of boost in that a-wing i just always boost drift boost drift because <laughs> There's no penalty for doing that. You yeah. can do it all, yeah. all damn day, and there's there's, yeah, there's no downside. <laughs> in a yeah. tie interceptor, your lasers really don't recharge much if you keep the the engines maxed. So in the A wing, what I'll do is I will overcharge the shields, and then I will go half lasers, full engines. And doing that, I will you know um, that's that's where I'll keep it when I am not in the middle of the uh, boost drift chain. But I'll use that boost drift chain to get around, and having you know, boost all the time means that my lasers are also regenerating at their regular rate. With a tie interceptor, that's not the case. You uh, you put all the power into engines, and your laser recharge is going to be quite low. So if you're wasting your boost all day uh, zipping around like that, you're going to have a bad time when you want to kill someone. You uh, you can shunt to balance it, but that will cost all of your boost and give you, if you must, you had a full boost bar less than uh, a regular full laser bar, and you're missing out on a lot of the TIE Interceptor's potential if you're not uh, shunting to overcharge the lasers. Mm -hmm. So really yeah. what you want with the TIE Interceptor is to have the lasers full at all times and a little bit in boost. And then mm. what you're going to do is when you get on someone's tail, you're going to shunt all the way to lasers. And yeah. because you have full laser bar, it's not going to take enough out of the engines to penalize your movement, um, mm. at least not too, too badly. It, at most, it'll take you down to like half throttle. Um, I guess uh, if you don't have any boost, it could hurt you. But uh, you're going to have boost because you're hopefully keeping in engines if you're shunting over. Uh, but you need to keep those lasers at least a little bit charged. Um, you're on standards? Is your own standard lasers these days or what? Um, I do use standard lasers on the TIE Interceptor. If they gave you more laser regen, I think that the rapid-fire lasers could be very effective on the TIE Interceptor just because they recharge 20% faster than the A-Wing rapid-fire, which are mm. just insanely fast to begin with. What's the, oh, I guess um, because they don't have the shields you configured, have, you might give you that. I guess that's exactly. the thing. Yeah, yeah. But, but since you don't have shields, you're not keeping power in the lasers anyway because you only have two power systems, so that's not really going to happen. So I just have a lot of trouble flying the TIE Interceptor, mm. which isn't even to begin to talk about, like, you know, you're going to take chip damage from things, so you have to give up one of your auxiliaries to yeah. use yeah. the repair kit, which is just a big cost. Um, mm -hmm. And not to mention, it only it doesn't have shields, so... On the A-Wing, I can run the Reflect Hull, which gives me passive stealth above 1,500 meters so I don't get targeted or show up on radar. And I can run the Scrambler Shield, which uh, takes three times as long before shields start regenerating, but 
it makes missiles take, I think, three times as long to lock on, or maybe oh, it takes yeah. twice as long before shield storage. Mm -hmm. I forget. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it really increases the missile lock time. So I can do both stealth and the missile jammer, whereas with the TIE fighter, you only have one system to play with there. You only have the hull. So you have to choose between the dampener hull and the uh, reflect hull, which yeah. is not a fun decision because, you know, on the A-Wing, you just get more customization to play with. So I can't mm. copy my A-Wing play style on the TIE Interceptor, which mm, is, you know, yeah. frustrating. Um, so I tried the TIE Defender, um, and it's a little, I would say, too good. It's, it's, <laughs> too, it's, it's too easy to play once you get the muscle memory down. And I think the barrier to entry is just that a lot of people haven't developed that muscle memory, um, or they have trouble killing things with it. Yeah. So with the TIE Defender, you have insane regeneration in everything, but you also have lower caps in most of them. So the uh, the boost recharges very, very quickly, but you have a short boost pool. You can only boost for uh, three seconds or something before the entire pool is depleted, um, mm. which is less than most bombers even, or all the bombers. It's, it's uh, obscenely short. However, it will refill very quickly, so you can use this for short sprints around the map was the intention. Of course, with the infinite boost drift chaining, yeah. you can just keep pinballing around. You shoot off in one direction, recoup a whole bunch of boost in the process, shoot off another direction, and during the time that you're boosting, because your other systems recharge very quickly, you can keep the shields and lasers maxed out. Which and, is Sorry, one quick question. Very, sorry, go ahead. Um... You're not using the APS system on the Defender usually either? I, I do use the APS you system. You do use it, the, sorry. So it, um, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But sure, yeah, go so continue, with, please. With the Defender, just, just darting around like this, you can um, keep all these systems maxed. You can uh, keep the shields fully overloaded. You can keep the lasers fully overloaded, and you can still have enough boost to be darting around and doing that. And that's very, very powerful. And if that is you know, their intention, that high-level high Defender players can pull that off, um, I, I would say absolutely go for it because I think if you lose the infinite boost drift chain, the TIE Defender is a rather weak ship. Um, yeah. And I would I would say absolutely go for that. I mean, it's but it's like nothing even, with, without the shields. It's nothing that ship for sure. Exactly. Like, yeah. So what I would say yeah. is even without even um, so if if you're happy with them being able to max everything, then I would I would nerf the shield capacity mm -hmm. um, yeah. by a reasonable amount, or I would uh, remove the fortified deflector from it because uh you get with fortified deflector and uh regular hull you get 1440 in shields which is a, a great amount of health yeah. it's it's a lot you, it's you can it's a, tank yeah. quite a bit of damage which means that you are more lethal because of this mm -hmm. because it allows you to focus your fire on a target even while taking damage um mm. and, uh, and now we come to the aps which is uh, while taking damage, you are attacking a target and you have APS. Because your lasers were overcharged, you're going to have you know plenty of laser bar. It uh, it gets used up a little bit more quickly than some others, I believe. I don't have the stats in front of me, mm -hmm. but it's not much. It's it's not uh, you don't really feel it just because of the uh, energy regen. And the uh, the stats for those lasers are the DPS stats are a little deceitful because. On other ships, sure, you're only going to get a little bit of overcharged lasers. But with the TIE Defender, you can absolutely do that as much as you please because it regenerates so quickly. You can fill that laser bar uh, from regular mm. to fully overcharged in about two or three seconds, which is so fast. Um, and then you have the overcharged laser damage, which I believe is 20% higher, uh, which is quite significant, um, which which brings you up to about... Regular think that, it's almost... 20% is almost like them being beacon, basically, at 30%, right? Like Exactly. Yeah. So then you stack the beacon on top of that, and this oh, is man. very <laughs> lethal yeah. ship. And it's tanky as hell. So if you are head-to-head -head with someone, or if you are you know, just chasing someone while you're taking damage, the TIE Interceptor is dangerous. Plus, while you're chasing someone, you can be you know boost drift chaining all over the place because you can keep these other systems topped off even while doing that. Yeah, It's not a very difficult ship to fly once you have the muscle memory um there is some difficulty with the power management but it's not uh you don't have to be very strategic it's just uh like i said muscle memory i mean another personally uh, so as just, someone who's like sorry. not not like a great <laughs> interceptor pilot at all i could manage my systems pretty easily without even 
APS, like, you know what I mean? Like, just flying around and keeping it going was easy enough for right. me. But it's working with, in the killing and everything, that's the tough part, but yeah. With the, uh, with the TIE Interceptor, it's just, you're going to have to do that a lot faster. Mm. So it, it does take a little bit of learning going from, uh, if you take, like, you know, an A-Wing or a support craft, where you have those three systems to manage, and yeah. it's, you're dead drifting a lot, and you are managing those. Going to the TIE Defender, it's going to seem like everything happens much, much faster, and you do have to be better at managing it but eventually it becomes unconscious it's not something you think about um very much you just get in the habit of you know keeping them where they need to be um i, I do want to talk about i think you just what we're about to mention again aps which is the mm -hmm. advanced power system for the tie interceptor this is an auxiliary that you can give up you know one of your weapons like dumb fire rockets or something for and it uh, you can fire it off once every it's twenty or thirty seconds. It's uh, it sounds like a long time, but honestly, it's yeah. I would guess not, twenty not because it doesn't feel it doesn't feel long enough for sure. It's but yeah. So what this does is uh, it will re it will give you an immediate eighty percent charge to engines or lasers and fifty percent charge to shields. The way to determine which of these systems receives the charge is to put maximum power into that system. So if you want to receive 50% shields immediately, you max the shields, you tap the APS button, and boom, you have a shield layer on whatever face you want. And that's quite powerful because it's the only way to regenerate shields under fire. Um, and certainly for a ship that doesn't have a lot of hull, like the TIE Defender, which is, I think, weaker than the TIE Interceptor's hull, you, you're going to need those shields. Um, and that's the best way to use it. It's a big mistake to use it for boost, but it's flexible too. Because if you're on someone's tail and you're not taking damage, you have those shields fully charged. As soon as your overcharged lasers are no longer overcharged, you can just tap APS and boom, you've got a full bar of lasers. So the whole time you're chasing them, you can have power in engines. So you can go max engines, half lasers, and still have overcharged lasers for two full bars of it, which is a lot of damage on target. Um, mm -hmm. so that's my general strategy for murdering people with that. And then I will just, uh, carry quick lock missiles, uh, the anti-starfighter missiles mm -hmm. to chase them down because I can't be bothered to, you know, when he's got 10 health and he's limping across the map, I can't be bothered <laughs> to shoot at that or chase him down. That's going to make me vulnerable. So the quick locks are a great way to finish someone off like that. Nice. So do you farm it? Do you, do you farm at all? Or are you pretty much only uh, a killer out there? Uh, um, in fleet battles. I will shoot at AI opportunistically in the Defender. In the A-Wing, you have to be a little bit more judicious unless you have rapid-fire lasers just because that laser energy could be the difference between killing someone and not. Mm -hmm. Whereas with yeah. the Defender, anytime you see an X-Wing, sure, just shoot it. Um, so one thing help. actually I'd like to ask you about here is maybe a good place too is I'm sure a lot of people have been in that situation against Defenders where, you know, they're just managing their system so well. They seem every time you get hits on their shields, it's, they're just recharging it. So it feels like you're not doing anything. What's your approach attacking defenders? Um, don't miss, do more damage. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, good, good, good advice against anyone, but because the defender hull is almost entirely shield, or it's, I guess it's full hit point pool, is almost entirely shields. Um, mm -hmm. I like to carry an A-Wings loadout specifically for killing defenders and support ships. Um, and it's not necessary for support, but when you have this build, you're really only going to be killing defenders or support ships. You carry ion cannons as your primary, which have more than twice the damage of any other laser system. Uh, it's almost three times the damage per second of the standard A-wing lasers, so it's quite, quite, quite deadly against shields. Um, but obviously, it'll only disable ships. It won't deal much hull damage. Mm -hmm. um, and on top of that, you carry uh, the standard auxiliaries for an A-wing, which for me are dumb fire rockets and quick lock missiles, the anti-starfighter missiles. Um, and then my strategy there is I want to remove their back shield face, um, regardless of, you know, whether they're engaging mm. me or someone else. So if they're engaging me, they're going to usually be facing me. I want to try to remove their back shield face um, with the ions. And ions recharge, I think, the same speed as regular lasers, but they have a smaller pool. So you will have fewer of these going in. You have to be more careful with your shots. It's, uh, I think, two-thirds or three-quarters of the regular laser pool. Um, but uh, the idea is you're going to zero one of their shield faces and you're going to fire a quick lock at them. They're going to hopefully have to use their countermeasure against that quick lock. Um, so you're shooting at them, you're firing a quick lock. They use their countermeasure, which means you have at least a nine second window. Uh, that's the cooldown of the fastest countermeasure. It's particle burst chaff. Um, 
And then in that nine second window, you have to zero the back shield face and fire and or lock and fire a second quick lock. And that one quick lock will destroy uh, your typical tie defender. Huh. Um, and that's 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 all you need. It really helps to have a support because that means that you need two thirds the lasers and they don't get the countermeasure. So yeah. if they are marked with that targeting yeah. beacon, they're in a heap of trouble. Um, this is a powerful anti defender build, and it's also good for killing young supports because supports tend to rely on their shields and dead drifting, yeah. and you can't do either of those when well. So the ions will destroy your shields, and you can't dead drift when you're disabled. Um, so you disable uh, against the tie defender. I don't try to disable him. Uh, that's a waste of my ammunition. I just have to, uh, you know, the laser pool is very limited, and he's very hard to hit. So I want to try to get him. It used to be you can only hit him between the the uh, drifts, you know, like at the mm -hmm. seam. So he would boost drift, boost drift. At the end of one drift, before the next boost, used to be when you had to hit him. But since the aim fix, it's quite easy to hit it. Well, it's uh, it's <laughs> quite feasible to hit it. <laughs> um, so uh, you. Uh, two quick locks and a little bit of ion, you can finish the defender. With the support ships, you're going to do a bit more work. You're going to disable them entirely, and only once they're disabled entirely are you going to use your missiles because they have you know, a bit more hull than the defender. You're going to have to use a whole bunch of rockets. You're going to have to use your missiles on them, mm -hmm. and you can't be wasting those, or you're going to be defenseless out there with that a-wing that only has ion cannons i've been mm -hmm. i've been in that situation playing against you geo it always sucks it's like and sometimes too just because i usually have a babysitter or something helping me out when i'm in the support ship i might be able to if you don't have someone there to help you out i might be able to you know what i mean like uh able myself get out of the disable and uh get away like it's, uh, it's there's the timing there for sure i've definitely seen that but it's uh it's so frustrating being disabled <laughs> when you're trying to trying to escape in the support ship. I feel like you feel like uh, maybe the most sitting duck of any ship. Maybe not. <laughs> this is this is definitely a team build. Um, you don't want to do this alone. So anytime I'm going to dive a support ship with this, I'm going to ping it and tell people that you know I'm going after this support if someone can help me mm -hmm. because with those ion cannons, you are fairly vulnerable. You you can't yeah, finish targets very easily. And it's going to yeah. cost you a lot of rockets and a lot of quick fire missiles to kill that thing, uh, quick lock missiles to kill that thing. And you don't want to spend all that. You want to be in the action longer. And if someone has lasers that regenerate, you can you know, have them spend that to kill it. Um, those are most effective against the TIE Defender, who has the very, very weak hull. So if you go head-to-head -head with the Defender and you're rocking ion cannons and dumb fire rockets, mm -hmm. you're going to obliterate him. He's, his lasers are going to be stopped by the dumb fire rockets. He's not going to punch through your shields. You're going to vape his shields in no time, and then you're going to destroy him with those uh, dumb fire rockets. Just like two or three of those should do the trick. Um, so he can't go head-to-head -head with you. If he engages you for a long time, he's going to run out of energy, even that Defender, just because you can zero his shield so quickly. Yeah. Um, but you may... Uh, you know, he may be able to dodge your quick locks, and dumb fire's not good against someone who is very skilled in defender and can uh, keep moving around so much. So you might, against defenders, still want someone who has lasers to finish him off. It's it's very much mm -hmm. a team build, and I think it really adds some depth to playing against the Empire, mm -hmm. because it that instead of just having you know one very vulnerable interceptor they have one very vulnerable very dangerous interceptor and another one that is uh let's say much less vulnerable but still quite dangerous and between the two of them one loadout does not do it yeah because this ion quick lock yeah. and fire rocket build is not going to take down a tie interceptor you're not going to hit them enough it's also not very effective against tie fighters because they have a good amount of hull and the more hull you have the longer it takes to disable you so that's more ions, which are already more expensive than lasers. Um, yeah. So how that's, much? That's a good amount of damage, and it's fairly maneuverable mm. compared to like a Thai bomber, which is not very maneuverable, mm. but it gets a ton of hull. So you can land all of those ion shots. You send it drifting, especially on defense. You just send it floating right past the shield generators of your MC, and the MC seventy five finishes it off. Mm. It's uh, it's pretty effective on defense. Well, we could get before we get into actually using the defender on some objective play too as a dogfighter. I'm just curious. How how reactive are you to what you're seeing on the field as as a fighter? How you know you're talking about you're switching based on, on what you're seeing out there. How many you know are you set up for different situations like that? Do you see stuff coming up a lot? How are you reacting, I guess, to those situations? I try to um, anticipate what the enemy is going to bring out, and then try to have the right build coming out of the hangar. Mm -hmm. If I'm worried they'll have defenders i will usually bring the ion a wing and just go back and yeah. switch after 
harassing their support if I uh, if it doesn't work out right. But if I know that you know I've run into these players before and they're running tie interceptors, or it's just becoming much more popular to run tie interceptor because since the aim fix, I think a lot of people are not as comfortable in the tie defender. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, uh, you just run your regular A-wing. So, you know, I've got the standard cannons, I've got dumb fire rockets, I've got quick locks, and that's a lot of firepower. The TIE Interceptor can't go head-to-head with you unless it's running double rockets of its own. Mm-hmm. You uh, yeah. you know, you have too much survivability, it's got too little hull, you're going to be fine. Um, but I, So I do try to be ready based on what they're carrying. In general, I don't want to bring out the Ion A-wing build unless they have at least two TIE Defenders. If they have just one, I will generally be like, all right, we need to pressure him enough that he will leave us alone. But unless we're really both going after him at the same time, let's not spend too much time on him because it's not going to be worth yeah. it. If it's a very yeah, good two on one. Yeah, exactly. And you want a two on one whenever you can get it. But if, with this one, it's not like you can just engage it um, at your leisure. And then, you know, if you have two on one, that's great. Uh, you really need that. Um, especially if they're a very skilled pilot. If they have, I would say, like a top-tier TIE Defender pilot, then you certainly want that Ion build, even though you're really only going to be able to hurt the TIE Defender and their support player, which is not a lot. It, it really takes you out of the fight to take him out of the fight, which is unfortunate, but mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. what you got. And then, I mean, yeah, like we are talking about, the, I just said with the Defender, I have seen you do, you know, some, some good damage. Uh, you know, you take out the weak points. So what's your approach... Attacking the cap ship and the defender, and also defending against defenders on the cap ship. So with the uh, with the A wing, you have sort of limited time near the cap ship because your shields don't regenerate very quickly, especially in my build because I have that scrambler shield. I'm going to have uh, quite a long gap between shield recharges, um, and I have to avoid sustained fire for quite a bit. Um, you have limited time, so you overcharge your shields going in. When your shields are no longer overcharged and maybe they get down to like 80%, you get out of there. And then you recharge them, you come back. With the TIE Interceptor, you're going to be taking chip damage from the MC-75 guns, and as that happens, or the frigates, you know, whatever it is, as that happens, eventually you're going to have to get out of there and come back. With the TIE Defender, that's obviously not the case because you have insane regen, you are moving all the time, and you have APS to restore that shield layer. So what you can do is you can just keep uh, chaining boost dead drift infinitely around the MC-75 looking for an opportunity. You see a weak spot. um, They're a little bit hard to hit because there is zero aim assist against them to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. You're going to fly straight towards that for a bit, but you can tank the damage while you're on it usually. Um, You take out the weak spot and they just keep dancing around. If you're playing with, uh, you know, some bombers, you know, and they get most of a shield generator and they don't finish it with the tie uh interceptor or something you dart in to finish it Mm -hmm. but with the tie defender you have so much shield that if your objective players are having trouble you can just dart in shoot the shield for a bit dart out regen your shields come back do it again um and when i say dart out i mean still be flying around the mc-75 you don't have to get to a safe distance or anything Mm -hmm. you uh you're just moving around slightly further away from it um, like the regular distance that you might be harassing dogfighters or shooting the hull. Uh, so while the shields are up and then you dart back in, um, you shoot the shield generator a few more times. And especially if you have a bunch of skilled defender players on your team, this is hard to shut down. Yeah. You need a lot of players on eye on and then, you know, maybe one or two without it. And then hopefully someone with targeting beacons to make the whole process a lot easier. But <laughs> yeah, that's the one thing I was thinking too. When, so when you're, when you're doing this, how are you? What you're balancing protecting teammates, maybe the supports getting out pings too. So you're balancing out that as well with with when you're pulling in to do that damage and pulling out. Um, with the tie defender, um, I'm actually usually very privileged when I play this. I have very good um, objective players. They are able to get in in spite mm-hmm. of fighter cover, mm-hmm. and yeah. many enemies are foolish enough to chase the defender down instead of focus- focusing the TIE bomber that's coming in, oh, or the okay. t- TIE fighter that uh-huh. keeps making torpedo runs, um, because they're, you know, the TIE fighter is just going to boost away, and they're like, oh, well, I wasted my time while well, that defender's still harassing me. It's like, no, those, those torpedoes count. <laughs> um, so you, uh, you can get away a bit with not protecting them. One thing you do have to watch out for is the AI farmer, though. Because it, uh, yeah. it seems like a boring role where, you know, you just shoot AI X-Wings and TIE Fighters and it doesn't do anything. But that's so many kills worth of morale. And yeah. especially against the cap ship, I think people forget about the AI farmer because there's 
so much excitement going on. They're wor- much more worried about their own survival. There's this guy who's, you know, not doing much to them, so they let him go. Um, but that's going to end your phase. It's going to the uh, the AI farmer's job is really to put pressure on the attackers to perform in a short amount of time. And yeah. if you are focusing down their AI farmer, they have to focus on killing you more. And obviously, you're in a tie defender, so you're immortal. So that's not going to happen. <laughs> and does the approach killing defenders who are kind of you know just flying around your cap ship change uh more so than in it's, general it's very difficult uh-huh. um they have cover which is your cap ship uh and they can use it to dodge your missiles so it's i would say paradoxically somewhat harder to kill a defender around your cap ship at uh when they are around the cap ship is when i would go full disabling them with the ion cannons i would unload and then hope that the mc-75 will murder them i uh i don't like def- uh, defending the capital ship against the tie defenders yeah. it's much easier to shoot down tie interceptors i love as an a-wing killing <laughs> tie interceptors it cost me almost yeah. no lasers it's like it's a free kill um of course they will kill you in almost a second so you have to be careful about them but i would i would much rather fight tie interceptors um especially with this you know unlimited boost drift mechanic because you can be cartwheeling all over the place and mm-hmm. the tie interceptor is going to have trouble landing shots well you can just you know spam rockets at him and he's going to die these uh these slight uh game mechanics that are different on these asymmetrical factions you would think that there'd be more people screaming about this or screaming about that but it's in, it, the game is in actually a pretty balanced state for having asymmetrical factions like i said like they're not supposed to be you know the interceptor isn't supposed to be a one-to-one against the other interceptor it's like the entire Empire team is balanced against the entire Republic team. But they aren't necessarily uh, one-to-one, even with the bombers or the interceptors or the fighters or whatever, really. And some have shields, some don't. Some move like hell, some don't, you know. I think it's very interesting that we're only a couple months after launch, and they've got a pretty well-balanced, overall, for the broad strokes, a pretty well-balanced asymmetrical faction setup, which is which is pretty impressive. I, th- I think uh, it's it comes down to very, very good game design, and I don't think it would have stayed this balanced if they hadn't put in the TIE Defender, mm-hmm. because the, mm-hmm. uh, the Imperial Interceptor is quite vulnerable, and chip damage, especially from something like a laser turret, will wear it down. Um, and obviously, the Interceptors at higher levels are smart enough to shoot those turrets down, but even just a few shots from that, it adds up, um, and... Uh, Doing that on top of everything else you're up to can be tedious, especially if you go near the cap ships. You just can't keep up with the A-wing. Um, mm-hmm. So we needed it, the defender in the lineup, you know, exactly. as far as like a sports lineup. We needed that position. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Because it not only uh, provides an alternative to the tie defender, but it also forces your enemies to compromise in their loadout. So they have mm-hmm. some ion A-wing to counter that tie defender, and that ion A-wing is vulnerable to the tie interceptor. So you have sort of a bifurcation you have to go one mm-hmm. way or the other you can't be good against everything at least not with mm-hmm. any build that i've seen you uh you have some people who yeah. try to use ion rockets against a tie defender but ion rockets travel very slowly mm-hmm. and they're very limited in ammunition and this is the tie defender which can regenerate its systems very quickly so that's perhaps a losing proposition those are much more effective against bombers and stuff where they have just a big fat amount of shields and you can obliterate them or as a defensive weapon where it will, you know, soak up laser fire in a head to head. Um, I think, I think the balance between the teams is solid. I would like to see the B wing become more useful Mm -hmm. because the Republic has had sort of a disadvantage with their bombers, right? So the Thai bomber, um, and I'm not an objective player, so I can't talk too much about this, but the Thai bomber is in a great spot. Mm -hmm. It's got good guns, good hull, um, and decent speed. The problem is it can't have the speed and the guns at the same time. It's got a shunt between them. And it, that's that's very cl- cool. It's a skilled mechanic. It makes you think. It's it's in a great spot. Um, and it's a very effective ship. It still gets used. The Y-Wing, on the other hand, yeah. is fat and slow. And it has um, a bit more to it than the TIE Bomber because it can regenerate its shields. Um, so that's more survivability. But considering most bombers are one-way trips the shield regeneration is not doing you a whole lot of favors and yeah, true. I, it's not i think they were counting on it offsetting that a lot more than it wound up doing it in competitive play so that's mm-hmm. 
it's something that they might want to reevaluate because the uh, the B wing, when it was introduced, it's a slower, more vulnerable, more deadly, uh, more deadly version of the Thai or of the Y wing, which is not something the Republic needed because the bomber was as it was already too slow. Its speed is makes it just too vulnerable. It doesn't offset the hull. And it's it's, uh, it's firepower just isn't worth it because you can't shunt into the lasers once you get there, and that boost is obviously not going to get you out. So <laughs> the uh, the tie the bomber is in a really good spot, but the Republic bombers are not, and yeah. B wing especially is just mm-hmm. filling a spot that didn't exist. It's it's a role yeah. that wasn't going to be there. So I think if they move the B wing into sort of uh, where the X wing was without giving it any anti starfighter auxiliaries and keeping it very vulnerable. But it's a faster, uh, less reinforced. I don't, I don't want to say weaker yeah. because it's obviously a very deadly uh, version of the Y wing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you've, if you reduced its auxiliary count somehow, so instead of five proton bombs, perhaps you carry three. I think it would be a very interesting counterpart. Um, and I think that's mm-hmm. something that can open up some opportunities. It might be a little bit late in the support cycle for them to try something like that, yeah. or like changing the boost because this will drastically affect the balance at higher levels which is as you said really uh really really good between the two factions you have asymmetric mm-hmm. gameplay and it's it's balanced as hell and it's it's very very overall yeah it's, it's I just have, so not, pretty not, to look at yeah. now my yeah. thoughts my thoughts on why there's only basically three usable ships on the new republic and you know effectively five on the empire is that the x-wing is so versatile like, you know what I mean? Like, people are using it as a bomber. I think, I I might be mistaken, that if, you know what I mean? It would just give the Republic, I feel like the balance might be off if the B-Wing was too good or the Y-Wing was buffed too, you know, too much. If those ships were too good, then it, the, the balance may go to the New Republic. So I would love to see the B-Wing fixed or changed to make, you know, just to make it more viable. I hope that they maintain the balance a little. Like, you know what I mean? I hope it doesn't push too far to one side. That's my only consideration about making any changes because I do think it's in a good place. It'd be yeah. nice to see it. It wasn't used in the cup at all. Like, we didn't even see the B-Wing once. So I'm kind of like, it, it's rough not seeing a ship used at high-level competitive mm-hmm. play. I mean, you know? but it, it really shouldn't be at this stage, right? Like, so if it were, <laughs> um, I guess, an it's alternative okay. loadout to the X-Wing. So the X-Wing can carry uh, torpedoes or some uh, dogfight, like, um, you know, it's got concussion missiles mm-hmm. and ion missiles, which are obviously only, uh, they only have medium homing, so they're not very effective against starfighters, but at least against bombers or fighters or stuff, you can get a hit in, and if you're very skilled with these, you can still take down uh, starfighters with them. With the B-Wing, uh, it carries the bomber auxiliaries, and I think if you made it a very, you know, uh, I would say almost as fast as the X-Wing, and still very uh quite vulnerable perhaps lowered its hull and shields a little bit it might be an interesting counterpart where you have a more vulnerable craft but it carries a different kind of payload so if you wanted a strike fighter that can bring the meme beam in you would get the b-wing with the y-wing i think just uh, just because it's missing that shunting you don't have as much laser power and you don't have as much boost as the tie bomber and the shields are not enough to offset that. So, and rather than boost the shields because that would, you know, mess with the damage on pretty much everything, um, I would say just give it twenty percent longer boost pool. Don't make it regenerate faster or anything, but let them save up a little bit more so they can get all the way in safely mm-hmm. because they're they're getting picked up from just a yeah. little bit too far out. And then if you give them a bit more laser regeneration to offset the fact that they can't shunt into the lasers once they get there, I think that would be enough to take care of them. Um, I think it can make the Y wing effective. The B wing is, um, I don't want to say anything too bad. So let's just say it needs to be reworked. It's filling a role that (laughs) didn't exist. Yeah. It's it's a cool ship and it's, you know, there's a lot of love put into it. You can see that with the way that they've got the gyro cockpit, they've got an auxiliary that works like nothing else. You know, it's uh, Mm -hmm. doubles the ammo count or halves the cooldown in your other systems, which is quite interesting. Someone on Reddit made the suggestion that. You could buff the B-Wing a lot if you made it, instead of giving you twice the ammo, having it uh, both twice the ammo and firing in pairs. So you would fire pairs of proton torpedoes, or you would Ooh. drop two bombs at a time. Yeah, that would be great. Um, and I think that could you know, really, really increase it, because then uh, you're, vu- you're still vulnerable when you're coming in very slowly. But the risk-reward reward, exactly, reward gets higher. Yeah. Exactly. Firing a pair of proton mm-hmm. torpedoes that is 
very literally twice the firepower, you can do quite a bit. Whereas with the, uh, you know, otherwise that auxiliary is not great because you're not going to survive long enough to fire off, you know, all, what is it, six proton torpedoes or something like that because you're going to be circling in this very slow B-wing getting off torpedo yeah. run after torpedo it's not gonna happen yeah it seems like the bomber runs are the most possible with the b-wing but he, i mean <laughs> i use the word possible loosely there <laughs> believe me but yeah it's, that's what i see you know or mess around what's what you can meme out with a little bit more i guess um i feel, I feel like in squadrons uh, in star wars sports of any kind is that we need to kind of protect the idea of the hail mary the luke skywalker dropping that one perfect bomb down the throat of the death star to blow it up you know what i mean like uh stuff like banning stealth wings or talking about well you know the, um when you nerf the damage on this one thing like i feel like star wars the story of star wars is those hail marys and those kind of last ditch attempts to like toss a bomb down the pipe uh, and hopefully it goes into the hole at the right second to kill that cap ship at the right time, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I feel that kind of stuff's important in game design. And I, I think that the, the double double protons or double uh, double bombs on that beast would be a great idea because it would just kind of strengthen that risk-reward Hail Mary. You are most likely going to die on your way out there, but you do have that slight chance of, like, winning the game or something, you know? I think that stuff's cool. And it's part of the story of Star Wars, so... Um, you know, we don't want to balance stuff so much that it's just a bland soup. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you do yeah. want those spikes of excitement and how they get their enemy lines and all that kind of stuff, you know. And I think they've got sort of that in the DNA of squadrons already. Mm -hmm. That's something that the game designers clearly embrace because the capital ships do not instantly kill you as soon as you get within their attack radius out of phase. They don't become immortal. They are intentionally vulnerable so that you can make sort of, you know, at high skill levels you can make sort of a last ditch run against it out of phase mm -hmm. knowing that look they're going to kill us this attack we can't sit and take it we have to take the fight to them kill the last you know five percent if we can do it on that yeah. star destroyer before they finish blowing up our mc-75 and we all you know I throw mean, what we've got against it a lot of close games choice. come down to yeah. that last that out of phase kill it's great yeah definitely yeah. on the high level they could, they could have easily uh you know uh, motive could have locked it off so out of phase you just don't do any damage at all they could have easily done that and i feel like it's probably stuck that's the way it is <laughs> and maybe like they've they've done this out of phase thing for a reason uh, mm -hmm. for i think those hail mary purposes and those those storytelling elements of like you know i snuck past in defense phase and just got a couple quick hits so next time we get, we come back it's gonna be a little, a little bit easier you know it, I, don't know. Was, I think it, yeah. it took it took something that would have been a very frustrating mechanic this phase thing and it's like oh we didn't kill it by like two percent, so we lose. That sucks. Mm -hmm. And it took yeah. it to, it, you know, it took that moment of disappointment and frustration with game mechanics, and it's turned it into something that is instead, you know, very exciting and tense. It's like, oh shit, you know, they're trying to out of phase our ship. All right, two interceptors. Keep watching anything that comes near. Shoot it down. Don't let them get near. Bombers mm -hmm. are going to try to hit, you know, mm -hmm. bomb the hull. Shoot some weak spots. We're going to finish this right away because you put pressure on both teams when you do this and you really ramp it up on both sides as opposed to making it, you know, it was close, you missed, you got a shot. I mean, I've seen exciting yeah. moments where literally the feed is showing, you know, uh, whoever kills the Star Destroyer, whoever kills the MC7, like they happen like that close to each other, they, they, you know, when someone just out of phased it or couldn't quite, that, that has the exciting moments of the game that you're, you're, you're looking for, I think. Mm -hmm. And it happens at, you know, the highest levels too. This mm -hmm. isn't just like, you know, Oh, you know, low low level players are going to cheese it out of phase or something. No, this is this is a yeah. deep gameplay mechanic that works best with coordinated teams. I mean, it's exactly like it's you said. Teams know they're like, oh no, it, we have to out of phase this now because we're not going to win. We're not going to win otherwise. It's like, yeah. yeah, that is the game, really. I think one of the arguments was uh, people were worried that the game was going to evolve into you needed to have a goalie. And they thought the goalie gameplay was boring, and someone had to be left behind to defend the cap ship out of phase all the time. Um, if if the out of phase tacking got too rampant, mm -hmm. but it, you know, but again, you know, the the developers obviously purposely left that damage uh, opportunity in there, and you know, it's a huge cap ship sitting there. We, like, why can't we attack that? You should be able to attack it anytime you want, theoretically. You know, <laughs> yeah. we're trying to win the game all the time, most aggressively, most efficiently, most optimally. So I think it's 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 interesting, but I I, I, I don't see it devolving into a goalie. You know, it's not like it's going to take one or two of your five people and turn them into a permanent goalie all of a sudden. Yeah. It just means you have to watch watch a little bit more and be like, hey, where's where's the fifth guy? Where's the, 
You know what I mean? Make sure you know where everybody's at. It's just called situational awareness, in my opinion. But mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think there's an important um, issue with this, which is uh, when they introduced piercing torpedoes, um, there was a play that some people started doing where they would sneak around the frigates out of phase and take out the shields on the capital ship very early, which I think was not good for the game. I don't mm-hmm. think that really it didn't require a lot of skill to pull off it didn't require a lot of coordination it was not a step forward in the gameplay it was like you know a kind of a cheese strat that low skill players could pull off and it Mm -hmm. would just require coordination to stop them um and i don't think that's a good thing i think i believe that's been patched and then what happens is the capital ships are better at shooting torpedoes down out of phase i think you're right Um, yeah and it's you you can tell uh when this mechanic happens, that it is um, the this you know being able to kill things out of phase, that it is both deliberate and that it's deep gameplay. It's well thought out by developers who care about the game and want this to be a balanced, competitive, enjoyable experience that you know doesn't bore anyone, doesn't get repetitive or anything. There are new strategies mm-hmm. to try out. But there's a lot to explore, um, and I think it's just a testament to how much talent and dedication you have on the dev team for this we're really lucky that it was motive making this yeah for sure and just to just to wrap up uh where would you like to see squadrons going in the future where where do you see it where would you like to see it (laughs) so i would love to see um a live service game where you have a battle pass that gives you you know you can pay 10 bucks for the battle pass whatever and Mm -hmm. it will give you cosmetic unlocks the more you play because there's there's a large uh swath of players who they have to be working for something. They need yeah. some reward in mind. They need some kind of feedback that shows them, hey, look, you're doing good by continuing to play this. Because otherwise, a lot of us, you know, uh, when you get to a certain point, you feel like you're stagnating and you're sloping off. And you need some kind of reward for continuing to do what you do there. You know, it's your it's your salary that keeps people engaged. And I think to keep a big player base and keep the game competitive and make it so that you have, you know, enough people to find a very fair match all the time. You're going to need some mechanic like that to keep people engaged. And it's something that you would need to plan out from the beginning. So you see with the uh, glory system in Squadrons, it seems to be um, one of the weak points of the game where unlocks are pretty simple. Anything you want, you can pretty much get it. There's not a lot of progression. You're not um, grinding towards something. There isn't... Uh, you know, some prize out there that costs a lot for you. They, they, it doesn't look like they had time to balance this and really anticipate what it would be like. I think um, I stuff think like that. And sort of the like idea of the game, that. too, I guess, that it's like, you know, it's a, you're not going to be, you know yeah. what I mean? That's, it's just this. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, something like this um, where you would need that sort of progression and monetization for, like, you know, figure out how to price the battle pass, yeah. how many cosmetics to make and give people, you know, what to give people yeah. for free in addition to this battle pass to kind of, be like, look, we're not just trying to milk you for money. We're trying to give you good Star Wars content. I think so stuff like that, you really need to plan it in advance. It's not something they can tack on to squadrons. Yeah. So what I'm hoping for is a squadrons too. I want it, you know, in the same time era, uh, hopefully, you know, it gets some single player that, you know, continues to follow these characters, preferably hmm. with a little bit uh, more grit or punch to it because the, uh, the, the, the acting was good, but the dialogue felt a little tame. Um, mm-hmm. Granted, this is something that was aimed for a wide, wide age range, um, and I'm not a fan of the Mandalorian because it feels a little tame. So maybe I'm in the minority here. Sure. But I felt like I felt like they could have gone a little more aggressive with mm-hmm. the campaign. Something like a uh, Tie Fighter, where you sort of, uh, you know, the Empire aren't just a whole bunch of jerks. They're uh, they're actually yeah. up to something. Um, this this could be. Uh, yeah, you know, you give it uh, hopefully a new campaign, but you really focus on this competitive element and give them a battle pass or somewhere to go uh, where you have sort of like the Rainbow Six Siege model of we're going to give you continuous content, we're going to give you new maps all the time, and to pay for that, we're going to give you a battle pass. And the people who want to pay for it can, but you don't have to. You will keep getting to play the game, and all mm-hmm. the new gameplay content, mechanical content, will be available to everyone for free. Um, and it's just a really, really good model that I think EA is afraid of because they had a bad experience with Battlefront 2. Right. But you know what? Um, Sorry, to, just, yeah. to your point, it's though, important. putting squad... This is what I absolutely think. Exactly like you're saying with the Battle Pass, but put, I don't think it can be its own game. That be, I think it should be part of Battlefront. Like, it should be I, a war zone not, to Call of Duty. Like, you're that's you're making it, a big mistake to try to do that because Battlefront is, at its core... 
a casual game. Mm-hmm. It mm-hmm. it is it is fun for a lot of people, and you can get very good at it, and you can be, you know, very competitive when you play it. But it's not a competitive game. It's not going to be an esport. It's not going to be something mm-hmm. where you have that mentality coming into it, and you have that sort of um, skill always creating increasing increasingly hard you know it's uh where it, the, the cliff gets steeper the hot the higher you climb but there's always more to go uh you, you, it's no asymptotically harder there's no limit you don't plateau somewhere and i think that's really important um you you keep it a competitive game battlefront is not for the same kind of player it's mm. not for the same kind of gameplay it's this is Star Wars and this is fun. You're going to have a blast. Enjoy it. And then that, 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 that is a good thing. That is not personally my kind of game. Yeah. I, I would not engage with that kind of content. But it is, it's hugely popular. It's, it's a lot of fun. You can see tons of people playing it. Um, I would keep these separate. I would make this more in the Rainbow Six Siege direction. Yeah. It's, you didn't mm. put Rainbow Six Siege into PUBG. And there's, there's a reason for that. It's Counterpoint? Cop mode. Counterpoint. I don't know if as a sing a game by itself it has well, I mean it did have crazy sales. It's like one point one million sales in October or whatever, but I just don't know if it has enough to sustain itself as this game. The only reason why I thought it should be in Battlefront, I see what you're saying. It's a great point that the base might not be right for this game, but I just feel like if it was part of it, it would just add the overall eyes to this game and the portion of that community that would be interested in a game like Squadrons may move over, and that gain might be larger from being inside a game like Battlefront than it would be on its own. That's my thinking anyway, but you make a great counterpoint that maybe it wouldn't work, right? Like, maybe what you gain, you would actually, the game would, the player base would suffer in the long term. So I I, I don't know. Definitely something to consider for sure for me. So I'm just going to keep comparing this to Rainbow Six Siege. Mm -hmm. It's a comparison I'm never going to stop making. There are two (laughs) games that both had really good competitive DNA doing something that hadn't been done before in different ways. The Rainbow Six Siege really focused on monetization, continued support, and um, tuning the game to make it more competitive and bring in more players. It It was all about support, support, support. And it started with a very small player base. It was, you know, uh, at peak hours, I think it was smaller than squadrons for the first two weeks. But it was support, 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 and there was a good grind. And people kept playing it, and the player base grew. And now it is one of the biggest games on, you know, Steam, yeah. on whatever you look at. Uh, it was because they kept developing it. Mm-hmm. And it, uh, it had some real hiccups. They had a whole, they called it Operation Health, where they addressed some serious issues with the game where... There were technical problems. There were uh, imbalanced things. There were just there's there's a whole lot that had to be rethought. It's a very different game from when it came out, but it's got you know the same DNA. It was a good concept, and they gave it a lot of care, and they nurtured their player base. They grew it. With Squadrons, it was I think a hail mary to get EA to approve this game in the first place by some people who really really cared about this genre and this you know hadn't seen a game like this in ages like i played x-wing versus tie fighter as a kid i never expected to see this again i i Mm. I was blown away when this happened this is out of left field i was i was (laughs) impressed i think i think think with the rainbow six siege sort of approach where you really nurture the community and you bank on it and you say look this is a viable concept we're going to invest in it because ubisoft uh before rainbow six siege they didn't really make competitive games they uh, they made open world games. They made single player games. They made experiences where you pick it up, you play it through, you put it down. They never had Apex Legends. They don't. They didn't have you know that kind of background. I think if you take uh, some people who are behind the monetization for stuff like Apex Legends and you take that experience, you combine it with the folks at Motive who clearly know what they're doing with uh, Starfighter games. And for the first competitive game for this studio, this is impressive. I mean. It, even for your third competitive game, this is this is a great game. I mean, this, um, with just some more balanced tweaks and this is like one of my favorite all time games. Like absolutely, <laughs> like it's crazy. It's crazy. I don't even like Star. I don't like flying games. I love maybe I actually maybe I do love flying games. I don't know, right? Like yeah, maybe you do. I, I mean, so there's there's some missed opportunities. Like you look at the uh, the sensor jammer jammer uh, auxiliary. Right. right. It's. Uh, it's clearly tailored to low level play. It's got a long cooldown, one ammunition, but it protects you at every range and it gives you a decent window of protection. 
there's nowhere to grow on that. At high level play, you're not going to use it. I think it's a missed opportunity because you do you could do things to tweak that and make it viable at both very low and very high level play. And people would sort of dip out in the middle until they realized, wait a minute, I could do something else with this. So you you could tweak these things. So like the sensor jammer, maybe in a 100 meter radius, it also protects your allies uh, at the second you activate it. Ooh, so it yeah, that would be awesome. Allies, it's just a very tight radius. So you're not going to have, you know, people constantly, you know, five stacks spamming this to cheese mm-hmm. all missiles off their team. But you'd have, yeah. you know, a support could fly next to someone right before he makes his bombing run. And instead of uh, masking him, he might be just putting the sensor jammer on him. Um, there's just some missed opportunities like this yeah. where they could add a little bit more depth to it. And instead they made it, you know, here's a low level approachable mechanic and here's some high level stuff. Um, there's uh, I think there's more they can do with it. And I think squadrons two would be a great game to see. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm looking forward to the next titles coming out of this studio because they clearly have some very thoughtful, very dedicated game designers who love what they're doing. Canadian company too. Shut up. <laughs> yeah. Well, Siege 2, right? Both in Montreal. <laughs> uh, so I think that's pretty much everything we wanted to cover here today, Geo. Um, what, what, you started streaming? What did you have, shadows do you have for, uh, for your socials and all that? What's that? Oh, uh, no. Um, I stream a little bit because people are asking to see me play. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I don't really engage with viewers. I, right. I'm not pimping my Twitter there because, here, because <laughs> I'm a physicist on Twitter, so I'm not a <laughs> streamer or anything. Uh, it's all you know, watch time on tips. That's what I got for you. Oh, uh, hey, thanks, buddy. Play, play an SCL. <laughs> uh, watch right watch the SCL matches. That is the most fun I have out of this game is just watching that high-level play. I, yeah. It's, ca- it's cast really well. Mm-hmm. It's, you get a whole bunch of matches every week, and it's the best players in the game going at it with on regular teams. Every match is casted. It's not like a tournament where you only see a few. Mm-hmm. And you can see them grow from, like, week to week, and the matches only get better because they're doing the uh, Swiss tournament format, which means that you keep playing whoever's closest to you. So in the first couple of weeks, the uh, the ranks kind of get figured out. You know, people get near their average seed or where they belong mm-hmm. in the ladder. And then after that, they're just playing the people who are closest to them that they haven't played yet. And you get some really good pairs that way. Yeah, um, man. It's so much fun to watch. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. cool. Shout out to the SDL. Yeah. Definitely. Again, I'm going to start doing some more coverage of them on the channel, I think, too, because there's just so much great stuff and we're getting towards the playoffs. So I'm definitely going to do some more breakdowns on SEO. Uh, Green Fox, what have you got uh, going on here? Anything to give a shout out to? Mm, just uh, getting ready for the fire of the the five man's dogfight league here pretty soon, and um, getting ready for the winter major of the Cow Racing Cup. So yeah, it should be fun. Very exciting. Yeah, keep your eyes out on the dogfighting league if you haven't. If you're listening and you're interested about that. There's definitely posts in the five man and on Reddit. They're looking for more teams to get on there too, and uh, yeah, get on board there uh what is today february 5th so tomorrow february 6th we're gonna have the orange invitational as well so a bunch bunch of teams will be playing like an exhibition swiss format so you can just see some really high level squadrons kind of preparing for the next cal cup and different scl events and stuff too so yeah lots of cool stuff yeah. going on also there's an aussie uh, uh, an australian event too on february 6th uh, i believe for eastern time est it starts so that's that's awesome and they've mm-hmm. got some stuff going on there in the south pacific i mean squadrons yeah, is growing season. guys yeah. as much as we're it feels like it's stagnated it is growing the community is growing the game as much as they can so you gotta love to see that mm-hmm. true so, geo thanks again for being on the podcast any last words here before we sign off uh, thanks a lot for having me i uh, really appreciate you doing this for the squadrons community and i uh, hope to see more of orange squadron on reddit posts oh yeah we hope we get mm-hmm. you know we play early enough that the player base is low that they will complain about us so i feel feel like we got one cooking <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks a lot for nice checking one. out this episode of the podcast we'll be back next week i'm time bomb green fox leader geo thanks again and we will catch you guys next time Five on the star squadron Five on the star squadron